Here we go. Showtime. Recording in progress. Okay, good afternoon. Let's call uh, court back into session. It's 1.30 uh, on Wednesday, the 21st, 2021. Okay, Francis. Um, so today we have um, some entities lined up to come in and speak on their request. We have um, Emergency Management, Fire Protection Services, The Cove, Brazos Trail, and then MHMR um, to speak on all of their contracts. Um, and I know if y'all need to... If, you, if there's someone else that comes in or you need to break for some reason, you know, of course, just let me know. Um, okay. We hope to get through those today. And then um, at the end of the day, I have some just general budget information I want to talk to you about um, before we, we start tomorrow. So okay. that's the plan for today. And then tomorrow we'll be on personnel. Personnel and some things we need to wrap up. We'll go back to this contracted programs, economic development list, see if you have any feelings there. Um, just make sure that, that we can get the proposed budget as complete as as, as you as you want it to be for Tuesday. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. So, uh, Elizabeth. Yes. So we can start with um, emergency management, and um, the the packet that I passed out is just an updated list with with all of these entities and their requests and some historical information. Um, attached is the the physical copies of the request for today's presentations. These are also all on the budget workshop drive. So if you'd prefer to look at them that way, they are there. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Francis, is it all right if we actually talk about um, the association first, talk about course. their criteria, just because they're, you know, it's their day off, so I want them to get up here and yeah. talk about it. So, y'all come up here. Put you on stage. <laughs> you can have a seat, and there just you can pull another chair up there if you want to. Okay. All right, I'll let them introduce themselves first and go forward. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having us. My name is Jeff Wilhelm. I'm the uh, Fire Protection Association's president for this year and next. Um, I, my fire department to get me in. I'm a Waco firefighter, a deputy chief for the city of Beverly Hills, and the commander of a rehab unit that is also part of the association. Good afternoon, Andy Burr, assistant chief of Downsville. Um, thanks for coming in today and chew your ear off a little bit. Y'all sell a lot of barbecue. Yes, sir. Good. Yes, sir. Good. Yeah. And yeah. Andy's our training uh, chairperson. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I have these gentlemen here with me today is because they have come up with an inspection protocol. Um, you know, as we all know, the volunteer fire departments receive funds from McLennan County, you know, to help them with keeping order, keeping up their business and doing everything they need to do to provide the best services they can for the residents of McLennan County. And so what they've come up with is an inspection protocol and a criteria in order to maintain some accountability um, and also transparency on what these volunteer fire departments are doing making sure they're up to date on NIMS compliance, training, response, um, making sure they're in good standing with the association. And so this is just a way to keep them accountable and making sure, and we want to take this, bring this to court to see what your thoughts were on this idea and seeing if this is something we could implement with the contracts for next year. And I'll let these guys answer. And is there anything else you want to talk about for the contract? Uh, no, not for the contract for next year, as far as this goes. We'll talk about budget stuff whenever doing the radios and stuff. Okay. So, so what you've given us here is, is a proposal for uh, in, inspection protocols? Yes, sir. And who, who will do the inspections then? So the ideal is that uh, uh, we're, we match the same four precincts that you guys do. So we actually have a chairperson over each one of the precincts. That chairperson will be ultimately responsible for their entire precinct, but they will have two additional personnel assigned to them to go out and do these inspections obviously they can't do their own inspection right, right? so they, they may not that's why we've got to have two people from two different departments we will once the criteria is met we will have the inspections done by march of every year that was already in our bylaws from 
wait who knows how long ago. It's just we never had an inspection criteria to go with. And then obviously without any kind of meat on the bone for the inspection, that's why we, we want to tie this to the funds that they're receiving because they are taxpayer funds. And so, it, okay, go ahead. You guys would come back before the court with the inspections after that period of time? And At March, we, we either, either way, that, that can be worked if we give them to Elizabeth and then she gives them to you guys or we have to come in here and present them to you or whatever. But yes, they will come to you in some form or fashion with their grading score. Obviously, the first year, we want to give them one additional chance to come up to the criteria without any kind of other penalty fees or anything. So the first year, at least, we want two inspections for them to be able to get 100%. Okay, and, and inspection has to be completed before April. I think of what this says. Uh, it, it says before April, so March is our deadline. Yeah. March is so, your, your yeah, deadline. March 31st, April 1st. And so you're saying this then would affect their their budget uh, for the following yes. Okay, yes. year. Okay. Yeah, because you've already given them the money. Right, for that. right. Yeah. Okay. So yes, it would be the following year. Yeah. Looking at this, do you see uh, we're going to, we're not creating any undue hardships for small, it's, it's a doable and, and it's needed even, yes. even the smallest. Uh, so there was some, the, there was some conflict on there. So, you know, one of them on there is a five, a, a truck that can pump 500 gallons per minute. So we gave them an alternate term, uh, alternate way to do that. If they have two smaller trucks that can can pump attack lines, two different attack lines off of two different trucks, which most everybody has, we don't have any problems with that. So we we went through there and, and done all that stuff. Some a lot of the training that's in there is online training. It's free. It's actually required by national if you want to get any kind of federal grants and everything. And that actually doesn't just affect the fire association. It can actually affect emergency management's grants because we fall under that umbrella. So we can we can do that. So we, we want to make sure that everybody falls under yeah. that stuff. Yeah, Out of these uh, these areas of, of compliance, where do you where would you if you could point to an area that you think might pose the biggest problem? What would it be? Um, well, there's about three: and, and <laughs> equipment, response, and uh, training. With, I want to throw something out real quickly. I talked to Commissioner Smith earlier today about this. Figured equipment would be the first one. Yes. Uh, I want us to consider in our uh, rescue funding. Um, these guys were deprived for a year for the most part of having a fundraiser or one that would be successful and generate the revenue they're used to having. And I spoke with Dustin briefly. He thinks it probably fits in, but I, I think we do what we normally do out of the general fund and then I would like to see us look at, at, at giving these uh, these guys another fifteen or twenty thousand dollars for that sole purpose right there. Out of ARPA. Out of out of the ARPA funds. That's a great idea. Uh, because I knew equipment would probably be it, and you just can't go out and and buy that any day of the week uh, without having the funding. And so if we're going to hold you to this, I would like to see us consider that. Well, especially if it's. Uh if they're having trouble with compliance due to the lack of equipment, uh, for sure. Uh, but also, uh, this there's a lot we don't know about this American Rescue Plan Act, but we do have some half of the money in the bank account. So we're working on trying to figure out how it can best be utilized. But uh, you know, communication or this is a life safety issue. And something we've been working across, right. working on across yeah, the county. November, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, you know, that's the other thing. So, yeah, having equipment to get up to be in easily uh, get in compliance, and then the other is uh, enhancing the communication piece as well. Yeah, with the active 911 and the 800. Yeah. And so we don't know, uh, we can't tell you today that what Commissioner Perry is suggesting we can do, but we're going to try to figure out. It'll just be part of yeah. that we keep right. coming up with ideas. We put them on there until we know right. whether right. we can actually do it. But to me, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to know, to vote to put this in place, knowing that you got three or four departments that can't yeah. pass it because of the equipment. It makes no sense. So we, we think we need to and, figure and out. And to be work. honest, there is some of the departments on there that it's such a, each line item is such a small line item that there's a couple of them that they just said were we're just going to take a hit on that. 
Mm -hmm. And so they understand that too. So each line item is weighted the same amount or at uh, well? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it has this, has this document gone before all the, before all of the, the, the association? Not all yeah. the association. Well, it went through the association for two meetings, right? And uh, I can't say that everybody was there because we got some people that don't show up. And we've got some people that they only show up. Our rotation, because there's 27 fire departments, 28 agencies in the association, the, the meetings rotate down in alphabetical order. So you're only required to be there once every two years because that's when you're, you host it, right? We are in the process of enforcing, you don't stand, you're not in good standing anymore. If you're not in good standing, it'll go against this this part here. Um, you know, if you fail to do your inspection because you haven't showed up, then obviously you're gonna get a zero because you won't let us come in the door. And then we can deal with that as that comes about, you know, if they don't want us to come in the door. Um, so we, we had two meetings to discuss this. We, we brought the first list up. We, hey, how do you feel about it? You know, I think you need to tweak some stuff. Pull it, pull, we pulled one item that was a little bit too aggressive. And then we changed the 500 gallon minute to the capability of pumping two hand lines at, at one time, which is what is required for a structure fire life and safety recovery is what that's, that's based off of. And uh, so everybody that was there, uh, there, they, there was a little bit of, well, why are we doing this? And it's because taxpayers and we should do this. And we have a couple of fire departments that are not keeping up with their end of the deal. And we need to, uh, we need to get that out there to see who they are and, and address that in the future. And that's what this whole part was for. Uh, and just one more piece to finish up on this too. Obviously, uh, Elizabeth, we probably would need somebody to be the gatekeeper, so to speak, to make sure the funds are being uh, spent appropriately, and I don't know if your office could, I mean, this is just an idea that came up this morning, but mm -hmm. it just doesn't make a lot of sense for us to hold you to this, and if you don't pass, we don't give you funding, mm -hmm. but we gave it to you knowing you couldn't pass it anyway. It just doesn't, we're just making things worse. Yeah, I think what they had decided was the funding wouldn't be just taken away. It would be put into a pot, and the association would work to help them get up to standard and get in compliance. So it's not going to be they don't ever get that funding. It'd just be set aside. The association, the board would work to help the whichever department was, you know, if they were lacking equipment or needed some help with training, they could work to help them with that. And, and then if after so long, the idea was if, if they didn't come up, obviously we can't hold those funds forever. They could, they could be moved over into the training division. Uh, we are, uh, this year we have upped the availability to uh, remove, to move assets, training assets. We have two trailers that belong to the association now that have training assets in them. We've just ordered another uh, forcible entry door. Right now there's only two forcible entry doors in the entire county. One of them is in Lacey Lakeview. They won't, he can't leave Lacey Lakeview and the other one's at MCC and he can't leave the MCC. So this one will be put into one of our trailers. It's already on order, should be shipping any day now. The capability will be to take it to a fire department, allow them to set it up, allow them to train on it. We can even send some of our trainers, that's why Andy's here, because he's gonna be in charge of that, to train on that forcible entry door. Let them have it for however long we want, move it to another fire department, continue on. We have smoke uh, uh, smoke maze, SCBA maze, and uh, I can't remember, besides the fire safety house. What's in the white chair? It's a big, but we're also looking at building more. And so that's where that funds would go into to assist in building more training that is more movable. I can't send my fire department to MCC to train all 100% of them because I have to leave 50% left to cover my territory. So I can't empty my city of all my first responders to send them to MCC and then I expect half my people to have the information, half of them not. This way we can bring the training to everybody else. They meet on Tuesdays, we meet on Thursdays. It's just not feasible without having portable equipment. I had a question because um, I do know a lot of these departments are manned by, by volunteers uh, and I understand the need to make sure that they're adequately trained because we've had some issues in the past and so I respect and, and understand why you would uh, put such an emphasis on training. Um, my question would be back to tying that training to the funding because I know a lot of those departments use county funding to kind of match or pull down grants and to use it in other ways. So it's kind of a, I'm not saying it's not needed, but it is a serious step to, to tie their uh, funding 
to this, um, but you said you've had a, a time period maybe where they've had a time to be acclimated to this. Do they agree with this? Are your associations on board with this? The association, the member, the members have voted. It was last year when we brought this October, November. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we voted the month before, which carried the month before, so they agreed to it. Um, as a general body, yes, we it was yeah. unanimous. We didn't have anybody voting. Oh, it was unanimous. Yeah, like I said, not everybody was there to vote because okay. they don't all show up. I know that I can get the roster of who was there, but I think we had 20 plus out of the 28 that's required to vote. Okay. So, I, I support your need to make sure that they're safe, and that comes through training. I, I do understand why you would do it just a little... I guess gun shy of tying their their funding to it when for some of them we're a substantial source of, of revenue. And so that's the one thing is so this inspection wouldn't have to be completed until March of twenty two. Okay. So they have another period of acclimation if it's voted on next month or this month or this week or whatever. It's we have another full rest of this year and three months into next year to do that. Okay. And then again, we would like for that first year, yes, we were gonna have the initial inspection done by the end of March, mm -hmm. but we would like to give them a little bit extra window if they fail mm -hmm. a certain item and it's something that we can see that we can help them with. Okay. Uh, a lot of resources in this last year since this document has been presented to the, the association with all the members there, uh, a lot of equipment has changed hands because we've like, hey, I've got this extra and somebody's like, well, I need that. So we're actually moving equipment around within the county. And I'm talking small stuff like hoses, hose adapters, all the way up to um, Downsville did not have a truck that was capable of 500 gallons per minute. The city of Beverly Hills received some money from a, a supporter that passed away and we purchased a used truck. So we gave our thousand gallon per minute truck to Downsville. So they now meet the criteria because they were one of the only two departments that didn't meet the criteria at the time for 500 gallon per minute bumper. So we've re released them from that burden. So in this last year, we've done a lot of trading of extra equipment that people have been able to find and acquire that is just extra. So we are helping each other out. Good. Any other questions? Anybody have? Sound like a good step forward. She's got our numbers. Okay. If you don't get any questions, you can find us. All Thank right. you all very much for your time. We do appreciate it. I appreciate y'all's time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And on that topic, you know, we have um, the amount in the budget um, is sufficient to cover the, the way that the contracts are currently worded. So $5,500 plus $30 for each um, piece of, of an unincorporated area. So yeah. those contracts, you know, state those amounts. So the, the budget will cover that plus the 9500 that we give to the association. Right. Um, but as those contracts come up and if you choose to change those, you know, if that affects those funds, we can always okay. amend that amount there. But And what we can do out of the American Rescue Act really doesn't need to come through this budget. It's it's mm -hmm. already a separate, the dollars are here. We just need to yes. be sure we understand the rules and then uh, prioritize the ask and uh, and go from there. Yes, yes sir. One other question, because y'all didn't, you didn't move fast enough, so you didn't get out of here. Uh, <laughs> in your proposal, will you address, I guess, the response time or the relinquishing of the role of the Robinson Fire Department? Did you, oh, Liz was going to speak to that? A little bit more, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the Bagby territory. The, the Bagby okay. area, so okay. we're ready to. Thank y'all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, so the Bagby area, you guys, um, everyone should have a, I believe should have a copy of the proposal that came from Chief Summers to cover um, the unincorporated area that's off of Bagby. It's kind of between Alliance Parkway and kind of that neighborhood that borders Waco. That was whenever the city of Hewitt stopped providing fire services outside of their jurisdiction. They only stick within the city of Hewitt limits. And so um, Robinson was supposed to take over that temporarily. They took her over that temporarily in 2013. And so it's been a long time coming. And so um, we had a meeting with the city of Waco to discuss having the city of Waco take over that area. They're closer to respond to it, to meet their response time. You know, having a unit within four minutes and having the ability to assemble 15 personnel on that scene within eight minutes. And that's a key crucial, that's NFPA standards right there, is to have those people and to make, ha meet their call times. 
And so the proposal that they wanted to go with, um, the city of Waco has come up with a recommended flat rate of $500 per incident per apparatus, not to exceed 35,000 in a fiscal year. And to kind of give you an idea, um, in 2019, there were five calls to that area that would have been charged for. In 2020, there were 22 calls. So neither one would have meet, met or exceeded yeah. that 35,000. Okay. Those, yeah, those 22 calls are almost all, not all of them, because there have been some vehicle accidents, mm -hmm. but there's a, a nursing new nursing home nursing that's home. been built out there. And every time a patient experiences any physical difficulty, mm -hmm. they put a call into 911 and Robinson simply can't meet that four minute response time for all those emer uh, emergency medical calls. They just, they, they're, a volunteer fire department can't do that. And uh, I think out of the 28 calls I've looked at that were logged, I think 14 of them were medical emergency calls of some sort. So with that being said, uh, I know out in the county, the sheriff's office, if you have an issue out in the county, I'm pretty sure just an ambulance rolls out to that. You don't mm -hmm. always get a, if it's at a nursing home, why would, and it's not in the city limits of Waco, why it's would we a, need them to roll a fire truck? It's not a fire. When an ambulance is coming to a nursing yeah, home. What, yeah, what, that's going to be $500 every time they go to the nursing home. Yeah. Um, from my understanding, it would be that I believe that sometimes the fire department will beat the nurse um, ambulances mm -hmm. there, and that's why they respond to calls there. And so they're going to be responding they're if they are EMTs. not. But there's yeah, medical. They're all EMTs. But we're, we're sending them to where there's medical personnel, medical professionals working. Mm -hmm. They respond to a lot of calls for other nursing homes. This isn't an uncommon thing for fire departments. Yeah, why to why, why is that? Because I mean, they have to be I'm, transported to a hospital. And we're talking about but, a but a fire truck is showing up. I've seen those. They're, they're, they're the, the first, you can probably answer better than me, Commissioner Smith, but uh, they can get there quicker. Mm -hmm. And then they assess whether an ambulance needs to come rather than having those ambulances roll out to every place. I mean, it, you, uh, Chief Summers was talking about that. that uh, they're first know, responders. Yeah, they're the first responders. But I understand. I just, yeah. if we're treating them like we're treating the residents in the county, yeah. and we're going to pay for that in the county, we don't roll up fire truck or a, in the city uh, they do i've I'm seen talking it about in my, out, no, i'm talking about out in the county right no but i'm saying in the city of waco because i've seen in my neighborhood if you do a 911 call uh fire truck and ambulance comes well, i used to work here i mm -hmm. know that i'm talking about so, out in the county but, but what i'm this, saying is, this is the county this is I, the county. I understand it but it's the city of waco that they're asking for coverage so what it sounds like they're doing is the way that they meet any other call is the way they're going to meet these calls and all i'm, asking all I'm saying is why? Mm -hmm. Does it? That's that's expensive to roll a fire truck to a nursing home where you have professional medical personnel already working. It's just a, mm -hmm. is it possible to ask AMR if they can mm -hmm. respond to medical emergency calls at that nursing home as opposed to uh, volunteer fire department or fire department? I mean, is it is it permissible or can that be asked why they they would require a first responder before they got there mm -hmm. we can ask that question that's something we're we'll ask that question have a conversation with our operator and i understand manager. because this is the county mm -hmm. and if this is the county why are we treating that differently than we do the rest of the county and to a residence i can get on board with it going to a residence mm -hmm. but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to go well we got to get first responders to the nursing home where there are probably already people that are trained beyond what a first responder is trained yeah. So that's part I'm yeah, having. That's, that's where I'm I did, I I know how he's going to answer the question because I've heard him answer it, and it's going to be that they've got a standard on how they deal within the city, and they're not going to change that standard. Uh, we can ask them to. I mean, I, that's what we're. But I I think that they've got a there's a protocol. Here's how we do it. Whether and so if they're going to take that on, they're they're not going to want to change that protocol. And Judge, I, th I think you're right. We did ask Chief Summers just, you know, on a standard call, if if a fire truck went and then, you know, a, an assistant chief showed up in a, That's right. a, a suburban, how many different apparatus would we be charged for? And he had said they would tailor that response to that area to where it would be the one truck to investigate. And then if additional units are needed, 
they would then dispatch those to come in. So um, I do believe it's just their protocol to send the truck to investigate and then they go from there. But it's essentially up to the uh, nursing home then whether or not, because the nursing home dials 911, they're going to get the same service as if a, as if a uh, individual individual call now. Yeah, right. And, or whatever their <coughs> emergency number is, I guess. So. But I guess the point would be if response is if we yeah. didn't contract with Waco, would AMR be first responder? Is the question. Isn't that right, uh, Commissioner? If well, we didn't contract with Waco, would would AMR be first responder? You know, well, I, I don't know. I'm trying to make some. And they put out a fire. This is what I'm trying <laughs> yeah. to do. Yeah. But what if they call this in a fire? fire what if they call in a fire at that? No, no. <laughs> hold on for a minute before we get. I'm trying to make logic of if it's a service that we're going to pay for, and we just say, okay, well, whatever. Shame on us for not asking questions. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing I'm trying to understand is if you roll to a nursing home out in the county, you don't, this is in the county. And, and I can understand if it's a little house right next door to the nursing home because there's not emergency person or professionals yeah. working or in that home, but there are in those nursing homes. And that's where the bulk of the calls are going to be. So I'm just asking for an explanation on why we would send medical personnel to a place where there's probably per personnel that are trained um, more highly than they are. Okay, that, I'm confused. Now. Well, let's just say- Because I thought we were talking about fire coverage for Bagby. Mm -hmm. and so the fire truck is gonna come. Different story. But then the ambulance is coming too. So Diff which one don't you- Commissioner Miller, we're uh -huh. talking about going to a nursing home right. on a sick call. The on fire truck call. will roll mm -hmm. to a nursing home. Is there a nursing home in this? Yes, area? yes, that's that's where all these calls we were are generated. Mm -hmm. Al almost Anything. half, just one, almost half of them, almost half of the calls that they've been dispatched to were all medical emergency calls, not fire calls. Mm -hmm. At a nursing home. At a nursing home. At the in, nursing home. In this Bagby? Mm -hmm. Yes, St. Anthony's, I believe, is the nursing it's home. It's a 70. Mm, but I believe, I think it's 7501 Bagby. What's the name of it? St. Anthony's, I believe. St. Anthony's. Anthony's. Saint Anthony's. Yeah. No, any other call, I get it. I understand and I support that. Yep. But I, I'm just questioning why you would. Okay, yeah, I, got, I was getting confused on which yeah. truck you didn't think should come. Yeah. We don't think the ambulance should come to the nursing home. No, it should, but you shouldn't. I don't see oh, why you should see the fire truck shouldn't come to the nursing home. I'm just questioning the. Okay, unless it's a fire. They may just say, hey, it's because we do everything the same. Yeah. But again, I want to. It just, I'm curious. I want to it's know. A, it's how they got their personnel. They, they've got their quick response EMTs on the fire trucks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. because many people, like uh, with the nursing home calls, they know that that person needs to be transported because they've fallen and they're injured. They need to have somebody that knows how to move them. And uh, uh, so those EMTs are well trained. Uh, yeah. I don't, mm -hmm. I know Waco mm -hmm. responds with a fire truck. All their personnel, they go everywhere in a fire truck. Yeah. They go to HEB in a fire truck. <laughs> but yeah. all the time. Yes, Robinson, I think, has a, what they call Rescue One, which is an ambulance-like vehicle that they, or they right. used to have, that they respond to some emergency calls that are non-fire. But still, they're responding, mm -hmm. you know, with their, EM, with their EMTs. Yes. Uh, we could probably get Chief Summers on the phone and get him to zoom in. Yes, I think that would probably be better. Well, Y'all are asking fire calls, and I'm, an, not, <laughs> I'm not a fire person. Just an explanation. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be come from the from the hollow halls of the city. Just an explanation as to why. Because mm -hmm. if we're going to pay for it, I'd okay. kind of like to understand why. Okay. I'll line it up. I, I know they need the, I know that they need the... Uh, to get within that four minute response time and Robinson can't do it. I mean, when you're talking about volunteers that have to leave home or leave work, mm -hmm. go to the station, get in a vehicle, get their equipment on too, get in a vehicle and then get, that's a pretty good ways, probably at least four minute drive itself, five minute drive. Mm -hmm. They can't meet that four minute. Mm -hmm. Correct. Anyway, can't do it. Okay. Okay. 
So. Do I need to call, do you want to call, try to get a hold of Chief Summers now, or do you want to move forward with emergency management budget and kind of table this? How do we want to? We can either get a response from him or we can, it, it, it just, it's just a, it's a question. I think that, you know the question. So yeah. why don't you ask him and he can respond to it anyway. And if, it, if it's just their protocol and all, I get that. But mm -hmm. if they're saying, hey, you got a point, then let's talk about it. But okay. If he says, hey, we're not going to budge, then. Okay, perfect. We understand. All right. Then I will come back and get that information and get that back to y'all. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. The emergency management uh, budget. Yes. I have some questions. Okay, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up um, Elizabeth's spreadsheet. Um, you should I think it's the first page also or the second page rather in your packet. Um, let me share the screen. <coughs> All right, um, so this is our budget that we have presented for the City of Waco already. So City of Waco, we did our budget presentation. This is kind of the base budget and what we are expecting, or hopefully um, once you guys approve this and this will be our kind of our final budget that we are expecting for this year. Um, we did have some increases and so I wanna hit some of those bigger um, line item increases. So we had on here special services temps. Um, that was temps for EOC activation, you know, during COVID-19 we typically have volunteers that'll help us in EOC disasters. You know, some people help manage the call center, stuff like that. With COVID, we were not able to have volunteers. And so we were having to hire temporary staff to help with EOC activation. We wanna make sure that line item's covered if we ever have a future activation, hopefully nothing like COVID, but if we ever did, we wanna make sure that line item's there so we have the proper staffing. We have a staff of three people, so we need all the help we can get whenever it comes to these major disasters. Then we had um, another big change was our um, our line item. It's 644815, so maintenance others. Um, the Motorola contract we have increased. Um, that's increasing every year. That's on a 10-year contract, so we expect that increase to come. We added a siren maintenance agreement. Our sirens are going on 20 years old, and we want to make sure we maintain them properly so we have um, those outdoor warning sirens for our residents. And then we had other purchases, equipment, EOC activation costs, having supplies that have to go with the EOC. We did an increase in office supplies. Um, we saw a need just for, in general, because we had the EOC open for so long, we were needing just general office supplies, paper, pens, sticky notes. You know, when you have an EOC and you have more people in there, you're gonna need more office supplies to go with that. And then we added, increased our supply other for, um, we have an increase in training and exercises, hopefully since COVID is kind of on the, I don't know, downhill, uphill, whichever way you wanna look at it, we're hoping to increase our training and exercises and making sure that we are able to stay prepared for the next disaster. And I'm happy to answer any questions y'all had about any line items in particular, but those are just some of the bigger changes that we had. Explain other expenses indirect. The very bottom line, it doubled. So that is a line item that is controlled by our finance department. We don't have any say in that line item. I just know that as a finance department, it's an indirect expense. And so, maybe so we're billed quarterly um, from the city of Waco for a portion of this budget. Um, and I believe, I don't have one in front of me, um, but there are some costs, um, administrative costs that are tacked onto that. Um, so support support for the emergency management office. So that's included in our, our quarterly bill to fund that department. Could we just get an explanation why it doubled? That's a huge jump. Yeah. Yes, we'll get an explanation on that. And then, you know, just to remind you, um, this budget is is split in a way between the city and the county. Um, and then the state also picks up a portion of it. Um, they used to pick up a lot more than they do. Historically, the state has been picking up about 10% when it's all said and done. Um, so that leaves about 45% each for the county and the city. Um, so if you look at that breakdown, um, the increase to our the county's portion um, would be $52,390 um, from one year to the next. Our portion of this budget would be um, three hundred and seventy-two thousand nine hundred and twenty-three dollars. 
So <clears throat> say those two amounts again, Francis. The fifty-two thousand. Um. So our portion of this, if if you approve this total amount, our portion estimated mm -hmm. would be three hundred and seventy-two thousand nine hundred and twenty-three dollars. Oh, okay. And I'm gonna type it in there too, just so you can okay. mm -hmm. see it. Yeah. And the increase you said was fifty-two nine oh three. And that, that, yes, so our portion, that's an increase of $52,390. So in that line item is about a that's a chunk. seven, so I, 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 I'm, that's a 70 some odd thousand dollar increase. So, well, it is. It's double. It's mm -hmm. a seventy-eight thousand dollar increase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but and then our but our portion of that increase is. is I'm just saying that the that's the largest. It's not reflected in the in in the changes. It doesn't so, seem very transparent. So I think I think the way the city runs this. That first column is twenty one budget. The second one is the base budget, and I don't I don't know how they we yeah. get some information from the the finance officer, the budget office at the city, but mm -hmm. they have what they consider a base budget, and then the that one column is increases to the base budget. So I think if you're looking to compare twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two, just comparing that first column to that last column, that's the true increase there. Yes. And, that's what it is. Our base budget is just kind of what we have, like our standard routine, just having like office supplies and kind of line items that we have control of and that we are going to change every okay. year. So that's kind of what our base budget is. That doesn't include like salaries and stuff like that because that's <coughs> not in our hands. Does that kind of make sense? I don't know if that helps. We see that sometimes like on the library budget, there'll be like multiple columns. Sometimes it's so. Yeah. So okay. they want to show like this is how much they had this year. This is what you're going to need for this year. And this is what we expect to give you for this year. I'd like to know what all those charges and indirect expenses are. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And I'm assuming that it's utilities. <coughs> and like that. Did you say something about siren or, or a, a maintenance contract? A siren, or? yes, a maintenance agreement for and the what, sirens. What, what, what number was that? That is in our line item for um, six four four eight one five. Is what we call our other equipment maintenance. So in there is the Motorola radio mm -hmm. system maintenance contract and then the outdoor warning siren maintenance contract. Outdoor warning siren maintenance. Yes, sir. Are y'all moving away from that? Uh, I've heard people call that old technology to the... We're not moving away from that right now. We have 30 sirens um, across and our residents are come to expect having outdoor warning sirens. And so, so we want to... to getting it on your phone? Mm -hmm. If people just want a reliable, or they think it's reliable, they've heard it for the last 20 years, and so they want to make sure that they have those sirens in their community. It's just kind of something that the public expects from us to have outdoor warning sirens. We still do encourage people to have Everbridge, which is our reverse 911 system. That's the alert that you send, and you get on your phone saying, you know, there's a tornado. But um, let's say someone's phone is dead and they're out and about, um, an outdoor warning siren is a great way to let them know, hey, there's something coming, please go inside. Do other cities have sirens? Yes. Uh, so the sirens, uh, City of West has some. McGregor, I believe, is going to update theirs. Lacey Lakeview has some. Beverly Hills has one. Belmead has a couple. Robinson had a couple. I don't know if they still do or not. I believe they still do. Um, City of Hewitt has some as well. Are those all activated through y'all? No, so we only control, they, those are activated by those um, cities, those, those, those jurisdictions. Cities. Yes, sir. That's um, just because of a tornado necessarily goes through, like kind of that Crawford McGregor doesn't mean it's going to make its way all the way down to the Waco. Yeah. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sure. And so we want to make sure that um, we don't scare residents ahead of time before a tornado <laughs> comes down. We like to not pull the trigger on those. So we control, um, our office controls the sirens for Waco, Bellmead, Lacey Lakefield, Beverly Hills, just because it's all within that jurisdiction. If a tornado were to come through Waco, it's more than likely going to go through kind of that similar path and area. And we're hoping to eventually add another one for um, expansion of especially the development along the Ritchie Road area. 
Well, where? Ritchie Road? Ritchie Road, where that area is becoming heavily populated, so we want to add an outdoor warning siren out there. That is in our plans. Is that budgeted, or is it just... Um... That'd be something we'll budget for. So we... Um... A good spot right there by the new water tower. Mm -hmm. There's that whole area where that area is developed is what we're concerned about, because we know that residents are flocking out to that area. You said Woodway has their own? Yes, sir. So theoretically, you could sound the siren at Ritchie Road right there at Woodway, and Woodway not sound the siren? Well, I know when they do in our house, my dog appreciates it. <laughs> why wouldn't you control the why wouldn't you control it for Woodway also too and Hewitt since they're contiguous since they mm -hmm. butt up against the city of Waco? That was a decision that was made. Um, we could talk to them about having the access. So I actually have uh, City of West is giving me access to be able to set off their sirens. But that's a conversation I would need to have with the city of Hewitt and city of Woodway if they would want me to have access to be able to set off their sirens because it's their sirens, it's their system. Well, you've got a good point, man, because Hewitt has their own, Woodway has their own. There's, I don't know how you can get in between there and, and have one mm -hmm. in that Ritchie Road area that's not going to yeah. hit yeah. either Hewitt or all all Woodway. Yeah. 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 So still questions we'll get from the yeah city. the questions yep. we can get for yes, indirect expenses and what that line item means so anything else okay, okay. check with amr or who we're going to check. yes sir will do all right uh thank, thank you thank y'all for your time okay all right uh kind of in a speed jam here <laughs> uh we have the folks from the cove here if y'all will come forward. Thank you. All right, welcome. Thank you, Judge Felton. It's good to be here. Hi. Hi. How are you? Doing well, thanks. I think you have a PowerPoint from us. Yes, I'm going to pull it up. That's <coughs> we wanted to just give you an update about our activities from the last year um, that included 37500 of funding from the commissioner's court and we're requesting that funding again for this year. Uh, we were able to continue to serve high school aged youth uh, experiencing homelessness even during the, the pandemic um, and the subsequent year with students going back into school and working virtually. So there were lots of bumps in the road, um, but we have been able to continue to provide support to, uh, there were 74, 73 youth this year that we supported at the Cove. Uh, we've changed locations. We're sharing a space now with Methodist Children's Home on uh, 5th and Waco Drive. So that facility is about double the space of what we had before and is new to us and is working really well. Uh, grateful for that partnership with Methodist Children's Home. So we've continued to serve youth partnered with Waco ISD and also now La Vega ISD and are continuing to grow partnerships with other districts in McLennan County. Uh, to serve more of those high school age youth experiencing homelessness. So um, in the next slide, it talks about how, how those youth are identified as youth who lack fixed, adequate, or regular housing, um, who might be bouncing around or doubled up. Um, a national benchmark is that about 10% of youth who um, are eligible for free and reduced lunch are likely to experience homelessness in a given school year. So we're looking to, to serve as many of those youth as we can and continue to expand our reach into other districts, having good conversations with Midway and um, are making good headway with our partnership with La Vega as well. So the next slide, we talk some about uh, the grant that came to our community, the $2.23 million grant from <coughs> um, We were allocated those dollars in the fall of 2019, and then those projects have started in uh, last fall. So for the Cove, that means that we're able to extend our reach to other districts and also our hours of operation to include daytime, which was really key for us last year when a lot of youth were virtual and not in school from 8 to 3. And um, so that allowed us opportunities to connect with youth. So they were programs, right? The whole 2.3, no brick and mortar. I'm no, sorry. I no no fixed what? assets or anything purchased. For That's that. correct. It's all programs. That's correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there is a little bit more information about the five new projects. The Cove is one of five new projects in our community. Um, so we've been really working with our system partners to build out across systems, the education system, the housing system, um, with transportation, in order to reach more into the rural um, parts of our um, heart of Texas region, as well as to begin to provide housing for youth especially those 18 to 24 whom we've identified early on as needing support. And then uh, now we have supported beds, about 30 beds in our community um, to be able to put those youth into supported rental units as those units become available, which we know is a big challenge in our community right now. But partnering with MHMR and the Family Abuse Center um, to basically just extend the services provided to youth in the region. So we, this year we served 73, um, 841 nurture center visits. Um, transportation is a big need, especially for youth who don't have guardians or parents to rely on um, to go from school to work to social service appointments. So we do that with three vehicles that we own and operate. Uh, we have actually paid for over 500 nights of emergency housing, and a lot of that has actually been in hotels. Um, because of the lack of affordable units um, and available units, um, we, this is a temporary solution until we can build out more system um, capacity um, to get youth into housing. But eight of nine seniors that we served uh, graduated from local high schools, and then, like I said, we're working with La Vega and Waco. On the transportation, do y'all use any public transportation? Our youth do, yes. Yeah. And that is actually part of what we do when a youth comes to us. We will go with them and kind of walk them through how to access transportation, how to read the Waco Transit map, how to find their way from here to there. Um, but there are plenty of barriers there for 16, 17 year olds to navigate that. But, um, but they do, a lot of them do. Okay. At 965, does that include uh, trans local uh, transportation or just what you got? Just what we provided. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we have two 15 passenger vans and one HHR vehicle, it's so kind of a small hatchback type vehicle. And again, we're taking youth to go get their IDs, we're taking them to stay in the hotel, we're taking them to school, um, really anything that they need in order to, to take a next step towards self-sufficiency where um, we're taking them to those places. So last year we, um, we received a little over 575,000, uh, 576, 491.07 um, in the last school year in revenues. Um, so that HUD grant is a big part and it's significant for us because it's a renewable um, grant funding through, um, through the continuum of care here in our region. And so that's exciting. Um, have private foundation grants. Uh, we're a United Way funded partner. And then also we're able to obtain two PPP loans in the last two years. So we had we're still here and, um, and growing and looking for ways to continue to support those youth who um, obviously with virtual learning, there were many new barriers, new instability factors that came up for youth, um, but having a safe place to go has been key. And then also having um, academic supports and help um, as well as housing supports, even if it is temporary and emergency housing. Um, mm -hmm. While we're building out those partnerships with other organizations in the community, we're doing what we can with what we have. So. Since you guys started in the county, how many kids have come through your program and graduated? That's a great question. Um, we just got our numbers for this school year, but um, 256 prior to, I think this, that was about up to Christmas time. And then we served, I think, about 40 new youth, so almost 300 unduplicated youth. Um, and this October will be five years um, that we've been in operation. So um, those are high school aged youth. Um, and then what was your second question? Just how many kids have come through and graduated? Graduated. So um, we have about a 90, 88 to 90 percent graduation rate, and it's varied anywhere from about eight graduates per year to uh, 22 per year. So um, I'm not that great at math off the top of my head, but I think we can ballpark maybe 60, it. Maybe something like that. <laughs> something like that. Don't ask me. <laughs> 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 but that's <laughs> right. But anyway, probably, that, that's a great close to seventy or more. There you go. That's a great, great number. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> economically, it makes a difference for those youth, but also obviously for our county and for um, that opportunity. Youth, you know, 
Do you track the students or are you capable of tracking them after they leave your program, after they graduate, to see what type of success there is? What it's difficult. Um, yeah, I think it would be. It is, um, but we we actually are partnering with Baylor, and we have a graduate level, um, I'm sorry, a doctoral level student who's doing some research for us on that in this coming school year. Good. So uh, we we're interested in that as well. What difference does it make three, you know, five years from now? What kind of supports you got in high school? Right. Does it affect your self sufficiency and does it affect your housing? So um, we're curious to hear about that. And good. Good. Yeah. Other questions? When you say the increased number of partners, partner school districts, is Waco and La Vega? That's right. Okay. okay. But there are 77 school districts in the heart of Texas region. Okay. That's, that's ours. I think it's uh, Freestone, Limestone, Hill, mm -hmm. Bosque, you know, McLennan. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking for ways to reach out into those partner districts, but obviously starting here in McLennan mm -hmm. County and looking for ways to um, especially work with those districts that are already working hard to identify youth experiencing homelessness because they're not easy to find. Mm -hmm. And actually in this, in the last year, the last two school years, a lot of those youth have dropped out. So we need to not just focus on partnership with districts, but also outreach, street outreach, and um, finding those youth who are no longer enrolled in school. Yeah. How would you describe the like what the uh, what, what um I mean where where are you with those conversations with other school districts uh, who who have y'all reached out to and mm -hmm. where 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 are they at now they're, they're I would say they're in nascent stages so they're in early stages um, China Spring and Midway are two districts that we've had really good conversations with. And specifically with some of their, you know, district personnel, so communities and schools or other school counselors. So we, I have not yet sat down with Dr. Kazanis or um, or the superintendent at, at China Spring, but those conversations have been happening kind of in a, a, a on a student level, yeah. But that actually is um, an important strategy of ours this coming year is just to increase those partnerships and a lot of it's educating both district personnel and campus personnel just to really know that a lot of times that youth that's sitting in front of them might really qualify as homeless even though they're not holding up a sign on the street corner but they they really need extra support they're likely to drop out um, providing social supports like what we do at the cove is is really key to helping them stay in school so that's a daunting task because uh, i think in mcclinton county they're probably close to 30 public and private High school. I bet you're right. And on, to be honest, we haven't really developed a strategy for those private schools, but we have the, um, the public schools are required by law to have a McKinney Vento liaison whose job it is to identify mm -hmm. youth experiencing homelessness. So that's kind of the target the population. Yeah. yeah. At least for now. There are 17 public schools in McLean right. County. County. I spoke with uh, Trina. Yes. <laughs> with our board members. Yes. Absolutely. And she's really excited to be part of your team. Um, but, and I know the wealth of experience uh, and education she brings mm -hmm. with her social work background. Mm -hmm. um, I know last year when we were talking, you were talking about your, your students who were graduating and how to get them self-sufficient, like living in an apartment, yes, you know, helping them to be productive adults as they transitioned out of school. And I see it still there as one of your goals. How, how is that working for you, and what is that looking like going into the future? I'd like to be transparent with you because that's a value of, of mine and of our organization. Um, yeah. I will say that COVID created some, some really big yeah. barriers, whereas we were seeing some youth further along in their self-sufficiency and their ability to graduate and transition with some more kind of tools in their tool belt. What we found over the last, you know, 14 months or so is that a lot of our youth are presenting with more and more complex needs. Yeah. And so we're celebrating getting them to graduation. Uh, we're creating these system supports for housing as well. Yeah. Um, and we're finding out that there are workforce programs like Upskill and, um, and other certificate programs in town that really are probably best suited for youth experiencing homelessness as compared to a, a two or four year college. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, I think we're making better decisions about how they can be self-sufficient in a next step 
that's right for them. Um, and also, obviously, there's a lot of trauma that has gone into um, what's led to homelessness, and so that's a big part of our work as well. So I would say we're continuing to do what we do well and actually really doing it better than we ever have because with this new federal grant, we hired five new staff and they're trauma-informed. Uh, we're, we're really big on um, training for staff. And so we have a really high quality team that's doing mm -hmm. what we've wanted to do a lot better than we have um, year to year, but that the challenges that youth were presenting with this year with COVID have, have been bigger, so. But eight out of nine youth graduating That's great. is huge. That's great, yeah. yeah. It's huge. Congratulations. Thank you. Do y'all, do y'all, uh, I'm sure you're in conversation with uh, MCC and TFTC about mm -hmm. opportunities for these, kid, these uh, kiddos that graduate. Yep. Scholarship opportunities, yes, grant. Yes, Good. sir. Super. Super. Yeah. yeah, and housing and, and other such supports. Right, right. As that well. They, that they would be able to partner with you and be a, be a, a benefit to you also. Yes, sir. The TRIO program is, is really a great connection at MCC. And then uh, we do have some partners at TSDC that we've um, worked with a number, a handful of youth to get enrolled in certain programs that were Fantastic. of interest. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I know I was um, really glad that uh, Suzanne introduced us last year. Yes. And I hearing your... <laughs> here in your, your program last year and the work that you've been able to do, especially through COVID. Well, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a fan of, of your mission and your yeah. work. And like the commissioners have already voiced, I just thank you for, for what you're doing. And I'm just here to help you do it easier. Thank I you. <laughs> I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Judge. We appreciate it. Up to date on what's Thank going you. On. Good to see you. Me too. Right. Have a good day. Uh, Dustin, if you can, uh, I guess uh, uh, we'll have uh, Andrea Bearfield uh, next. She'll be zooming in. Yes, sir. I believe she is on the call. Okay, good. There she is. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Commissioners and County Judge Felton. It is a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Good to see um, you. I will. I know that you all are, are knee deep in in this budget uh, uh, cycle. So let me get to my point. I appreciate you taking the time to hear from the Texas Brazos Trail region. For many of you, um, you're incredibly familiar, but I know that there are some new commissioners and I wanted to make sure that you all have a full understanding of who we are and what we do. So um, in 1997, the Texas Historical Commission was charged by our state legislation to create a statewide heritage tourism program. And that program uh, was based on original driving trails that created an opportunity to tell the story of 10 heritage regions of which the Brazos is one. Um, we currently represent 18 counties that make up the Brazos Trail region. And we have the opportunity to, um, to serve as our regional tourism hubs for the state of Texas. Our focus is broadened to include heritage tourism attractions, events, both on and off that original trail and uh, communities throughout each region. Specifically, the Brazos Trails mission is to educate, engage, and promote cultural and heritage tourism in the 18 counties that make up that region. You know, we do that in order to increase the economic base uh, throughout our regional partnerships through heritage tourism and preservation. Um, what we all, we, we understand that we are more than just the blue signs that you see and like the one uh, behind me on the freeway. You know, we are, uh, the stewards of time travel, adventure, and storytelling. And we have an amazing, we have, I think, and I mean, yes, I'm biased in the Brazos Trail, some of uh, the best the best assets that the state has to offer. As you all know, um, tourism, tourism was probably one of the worst hit industries within the, the, the country during COVID-19. Um, it was one of the hardest hit sectors during the pandemic. And 
while we are in a bit of recovery and we're seeing people do a lot of what I call and a lot of people call revenge tourism, um, it, it, it still remains uncertain. Um, what we have seen is that in domestic tourism, we're trying to, to mitigate what that impact of job losses and business losses looks like. And I think that we at the Brazos Trail, whose job was to promote and engage regional tourism and spur economic development, you know, we have a role in what it looks like to, um, to advance that growth and that rehabilitation. So, you know, we're here to kind of talk about what it is that, that we do and what it is that we think we need to do in order to move forward. Um, we are, we currently serve as ambassadors and cheerleaders and spokespersons for all of our county, our counties that we represent. We um, at the trails provide marketing and advertising opportunities. We do print, we do social media, we do um, distribution in, of liter literature through trade shows. We do newsletters. Um, we offer a, a, a 10,000 image deep photo library for people to use and utilize to in their marketing efforts. And that's our, um, our partners and so what do our partnerships look like? That's, you know, just like the County Historic uh, Commission that, that we have here in McLennan County. So that those entities in all counties, our state parks, our, um, our state historic sites, our DMOs, so our cities that have convention visitors bureaus, our cities chambers who function as their tourism leaders. <laughs> Main streets, all of those things are the people who we work with and offer these services to. Um, you know, search engine, search engine optimization and training in that purpose to our smaller and rural communities who may need uh, assistance in promoting and marketing their events. Um, you know, we have a, a, a boisterous social media presence. Um, we have done a really good job at engaging and, and keeping our social media high. Uh, we showcase exhibits throughout the community and, and encourage our smaller museums to collaborate with other facilities to do exhibit exchanges so that that way heritage and cultural tourism can be shared without uh, creating a great cost uh, for those individuals who are trying to do so. We um, cultivate our media. Uh, we know that, that sometimes that when we're doing a job, if I'm running a museum, I may not have time to do a full marketing and media plan. So we assist in those things. We do offer workshops and trainings, presentations, and uh, as well as annual events throughout our region. Um, we are Texas friendly hospitality trained and certified by Texas A&M University and offer that training to our communities uh, because we are known uh, as Texas friendly uh, in our tourism efforts. And that's one of those things that doesn't always come natural to people. So we offered that customer service training and we have, uh, we've, we've added just a touch of what it is to extend grace as we all are coming back and recovering uh, to the blows issued by COVID-19. Uh, but one of the most important things that we do for the people in our region is we are advocates. And we advocate on the behalf, especially for historic preservation, economic development, and heritage tourism. Um, one of the, the biggest things and benefits that I think that we are able to do is reach thousands of people on your behalf, you know, including the State Fair. Even though last year the State Fair was virtual, uh, the 10 trails that represent the Texas Historic Trail Program were still working for our people. We did and instituted a program called State Fair from your chair. So we decided that we would bring and highlight all of the communities that we normally do. We have the ability to speak on and hand out literature for um, at the State Fair. Since they didn't have it, we brought it to the people virtually and we had hundreds of thousands of people um, take information digitally about our various communities and we're able to still share our destination day highlights and all of those things. Um, uh, what we do know is that the pandemic hit uh, the travel industry in a way that, that the consumer landscape changed. Um, 
according to the DIG Insights report, um, consumer behavior across the U.S. 52 percent, and this is June of 2020, but the numbers haven't scaled down that much. Um, June of 2020, only 52 percent of Americans said that they were um, go they were only going to go to to vacation places that they could drive to within the foreseeable future. Um, so what that meant is, you know, 51% said they would only travel closer to homes. So that means that we're getting back in the car. Uh, those of us who are old enough to remember uh, those family road trips where you just get in the car, pack it all up and drive to wherever we were going. That's the, that's the way that Americans decide, especially Texans decided to travel in the midst of the pandemic when things began to open. And, you know, quite the majority of those people are still sticking to those guns. So what that means is we have a prime opportunity to spur our economy and engage giving people um, potential itineraries throughout the Brazos Trail region. Um, our economic numbers, uh, we're, the Texas Hist uh, Historical Commission prepares our economic impact statement annually and uh, while they have not completed 21s, we've gotten a snapshot of what that would look like. And from, from 2019, those travel numbers are still down double digits. So for Brazos Trail, specifically our economic impact in 2019 was a $2.9 billion, $2 billion. You know, we are down to just over $2 billion. Um, and what we have going into 2021. So that's a significant hit. Jobs were down um, almost 6,000. So 6,000 job losses um, from 2019 to 2021. Um, you know, and specifically uh, state and local taxes were down um, from 281 million to 230 million. So we're, we're taking a hit. And what, what we decided to do in some, you know, cause this is a slow process. We understand in the tourism industry that people will go back. I mean, they, they have often said that even after 9-11, the tourism wouldn't rebound. It rebounds because people, you know, have decided and are committed to going on with their lives. But um, what we do know is that it takes work and it takes effort. And, you know, our board gathered together to decide that what could the Brazos Trail do in addition to the things that we do normally for our people. And what we came up with was to create um, a, a grant program. And our grant program is one that will be available to um, our communities within our 18 counties, but specifically those in um, McLennan County that potentially have events or need assistance in marketing. And it's not a, a, a large amount of money, but anywhere from a $500 to $1,500 grant um, would be available and given to people who were ready to do special, fun, special projects, events or programs that continue to promote heritage, heritage tourism. So, you know, as, as we have events that are going on, you know, with it could be West Fest. I mean, if they wanted to add an additional layer of promotional marketing, we could do something for them through this grant program. Um, we could have opportunities to continue to promote the, his, the thousand plus, a uh, hundred plus, excuse me, historical markers that we have within this community. Um, you know, there are many visitable destinations, whether it be in Moody, you know, as folks are going to Mother Neff Park, whether it be to the Mammoth site, um, to Golson, if people are going to Homestead Heritage, these are places that potentially could benefit from this grant program because more many hands make light work. And we're trying to find as many ways as we can to help our local partners promote and market their establishment, their venues, their museums, their uh, sites, so that we can get more people traveling, could get more people spending money and spurring our economy so that we can continue to move forward and grow in Texas. Um, we are asking, I'm, I'm coming today, Executive Director of the Texas Brazos Trail to ask the county for a, a $15,000 uh, membership into our uh, 
what we have is a membership program. Um, and it is that that those dollars would solely be used for our grant program because we're trying to get as many people back active and back engaged as we can. We do realize the impact that COVID-19 had on um, on our tourism industry. We know that you know as, as going forward, there could potentially be you know federal dollars that are earmarked for tourism. My understanding is Ec Economic Development Association has is working on what the set aside looks like for tourism specifically because it was impacted so but currently with the American Rescue Plan dollars um, you know in line with what what the um, qualifications are you know does it address the need the negative economic impact caused by public health crisis yes it does um, could it replace lost private sector revenue yes it would because all of the entities that, that we represent that promote heritage and cultural tourism aren't all public, they're private as well. So we think that whether you decide to um, grant us these dollars out of your general fund and or use ARP money, um, the benefits would be great for our community. It would continue to get tourism back on the trail, if you'll pardon the pun, and continue to spur the economy that we need to advance McLennan County. And at this point, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Andrew, if you have uh, if you have any uh, uh, information from uh, trade, uh, uh, any of your trade journals or any of those things uh, that identify how American Rescue Plan Act funds can be employed, uh, that'd be fodder for the file for us to put around oh, when we absolutely. get into discussion to that. Absolutely, um, we've had conversations, and there are several uh, the. We belong to uh, CAPCOG in Austin, yeah. and there's several several supporting documents. So I'll be happy to send those to you all. All right. Well, we uh, any questions anyone have? All right. Well, we appreciate your uh, presentation, and uh, we're going to work uh, on American Rescue Plan uh, funds right after budget. But we also will take consideration on. Uh, uh, if it fits in, into our budget as well. So we'll look at both options, as you mentioned. I appreciate that, Judge Felton, and thank you, commissioners, for taking me. All right, good to see you. Take care. Okay, uh, Daniel, uh, you and the long, tall stranger, Tom Stanton, come forward. <coughs> how are y'all today? Good, how are you? Okay. Uh, Appreciate y'all coming, uh, and so we would be uh, open and ready to listen to uh, your presentation. Thank you. And I believe there is a PowerPoint. We've also got a screen right here in, in the front side of this deal, so we are paying attention. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And we are here to speak today, uh, Judge and Commissioners, uh, specifically on the uh, Crisis Hub project, which I know uh, many of you have heard about over um, the course of the last year. Uh, the project, uh, if you could advance, this project actually, um, as of next month, I will be wrapping up my year two of being the executive director at Heart of Texas Region MHMR. And this project had, uh, uh, was designed prior to my coming on board, but uh, I believe Mr. Stanton it, it has helped get that going again. And so we have worked in uh, earnest with the, the group of folks that you see here um, over the last year to really try and get this project moving along. Uh, it is uh, uh, something in terms of crisis services uh, that started in Texas with the 80th legislative session uh, when crisis redesign was developed. Uh, it, it implemented all uh, the different crisis services we are now able to, to offer within uh, different communities. And in 2008, 
the uh, Heart of Texas region leased the Clifton facility from McClendon County, and that was actually our first um, crisis facility here. Unfortunately, there was a regulator named Daniel Thompson from Austin who came in and said it doesn't meet state criteria because it, it had too many beds. Uh, there, were, there were actually uh, 32 beds within that facility, and once you hit 16, you can no longer build Medicaid, and so the center was going to start losing money. Uh, and at some point, uh, now I'm being punished for that decision, uh, that, that facility moved to the Londonderry, uh, current location on Londonderry at the back of the DePaul. And uh, over time, we have certainly outgrown that facility. And uh, the community came together and said, what can we do? Uh, and, and developed this concept of uh, building a new crisis facility, which will be much larger than the current facility, which during COVID, as, you, as you've heard other presenters talk about the impact that that has had, um, there were many times where we had to completely shut the facility down. Uh, we currently have 16 beds in that, that facility. Um, four are what are called extended observation beds. And those beds were uh, based on um, COVID restrictions had to be completely shut down altogether. <clears throat> Since September, uh, this is information I recently presented uh, and I added in the, uh, to, to the uh, Council of Governments and I've added in specifically McLennan and, and City of Waco data. And so you'll see for just those crisis services that we offer locally, which um, for all six uh, counties, uh, we've, we've spent $332,000 on um, crisis, uh, crisis respite beds. And McLennan and Waco accounted for 75% of those costs. And so if you look to the uh, far right, the total amount of dollars that we've spent just by ourselves is um, 3.38 million and cost associated with McLennan and Waco uh, account for 69% of that cost. You'll see that um, the private purchase bids are something that probably the other counties that we serve uh, account for the bulk of that. Those are beds. That's a separate book of business that the state has with us so that we can purchase beds. And the reason we do that is because there are only 2,500 public beds in the state of Texas for a population of roughly 6.9 million individuals in our state that have behavioral health issues. Um, now, not of course, all of those folks need to be inpatient but obviously um, we're not able to serve our numbers and so that falls back on the local communities. Data that I was able to, to obtain from the city of, of Waco indicates that over the 12 year period of us having a, cri a local crisis facility, uh, the calls just for crisis and suicide calls increased 167% over, over the 12-year uh, period. And um, you'll see that that has cost the city of, of Waco by itself $2.8 million. The counter to that is the data I was able to get from the county, um, which shows during that same time period, having a crisis facility actually decreased the demand for emergency warrants um, and warrants issued in out-of-county transportation by 40%, 14%, and 260%, which uh, I think is quite significant. Now, 260%, I think, is, is um, are a little bit erroneous based on the fact that um, several years ago, the state of Texas was involved in a lawsuit which um, demanded that um, folks who are deemed incompetent to stand trial uh, have to get out of, out of jail within 21 days. Well, that's, that current figure uh, means that most of those 2,500 beds I mentioned earlier, 60% of those beds right now are forensic, reserved for forensic cases, and the current wait time is over 460 days. So we're way past that 21-day ability to get people out of your jails which obviously increases your, your county costs. But uh, I, I think that's part of the reason why 
uh, that that 260 uh, 260 figure is much higher. So what we're proposing is uh, a brand new facility. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I um, always like to talk about with with my staff and my new hires are when you walk into one of our b buildings, do you like what you see? Do you like what you hear? Do you like what you smell? Smell is a very particular reason because if any of you walk into your primary care physician's office and the plaster's falling off the wall or you hear staff yelling at, at people or you hear uh, or you smell urine, what's the chances that you'll go back? What are the chances that you would send your family member there? And so the people we serve, while they may not always have a choice, we should always treat them like they do have a choice. Uh, and I say that as a family member of, of a individual that in my family that was paranoid schizophrenic. I saw this system fail uh, my own family member. So I work every day to ensure that we are able to provide the best. Also, ensuring that th this facility is it's new. Uh, the state standards are consistently changing. We will be able to build at the, the highest uh, current, most uh, up-to-date standards. For example, um, doorknobs are uh, something we cannot have. This doorknob over here is, is considered a, lig a ligature point. So we've looked at facilities where uh, lots of cost would go into just changing out doorknobs. The approach will also um, allow us to build probably one of the larger facilities in the state. Again, the, the current facility is much too small. Um, this will allow us to incorporate Waco Family Medicine, which is currently uh, co-occupying our administrative building down on 12th Street. and. Uh, we're working with them right now on a, uh, a uh, foundation grant request to, to implement integrated health across all six counties. And so uh, we would like them to be able to expand their current services, not only uh, not, not to leave our current location at uh, 12th Street, but also to be able to expand into a brand new clinic. And then we would like to also expand to include law enforcement on site, to also include substance abuse services on site. And as is currently the case, it will be the, um, the, the uh, access point to all crisis services, state-funded crisis services. We'll also be able to offer on-site triage, uh, triage, triage uh, and the, the fiscal health services, medical clearance, which we are currently providing through uh, funding from the city and the county, uh, the uh, extended observation, substance abuse services, and better care coordination, which is part of our new federal initiative, uh, and to ensure that we have better community supports. Our current task list remains at 52 and counting. Um, the center recently closed on a new facility in South um, on uh, Imperial Drive on March 25th. Uh, that property has additional, it's five acres. We're going to be building on the south side of that. We've hired uh, Brian Nicholson from Intrepid Designs to be our project manager. Uh, he and some of my staff are currently in the process of negotiating a contract uh, with a local architectural firm. Uh, the good news is the price tag on this uh, design on this project is 9.7. What we had allotted for architectural uh, services was 633,000. And at this point, I think I've saved you about 100,000 uh, on that because the, the architectural proposed budget is, is certainly under that 633,000 right now. Um, we're in the process of uh, uh, fundraising, uh, which brings me to the point that we would hope that the county will contribute up to $3 million to this project. Uh, the, the costs have increased a, a little bit based on um, current construction cost, but again, we're always looking for uh, opportunities to control costs. Brian is very uh, aware of that drive. Um, 
We're also working with the state of Texas. Uh, as you all, I, I think, know, I spent 23 years of my life working at the state headquarters in Austin. Um, I like to remind them of what we need on a frequent and regular basis. Uh, and in fact, over the, the two year period, we, we've brought in close to $4 million of new, new resources into the, to the region. Uh, we will also, uh, I managed to <clears throat> convince my board to contribute $4.6 million of our own limited funds for this project, 3.6 of which are dollars we've been able to get from the state thus far. Uh, and then we will contribute a million dollars towards brick and mortar. Since I've been here, we have uh, developed a new electronic health record that allowed us to uh, pursue what is called CCBHC certification, which is a federal and state certification. We got it um, in uh, about a year and a half, which um, is pretty remarkable. It means changing our whole concept of, of care from uh, performance measures to performance outcomes. So we're, we'll actually be able to start seeing people uh, improve in their, their health. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, also uh, started the uh, process of rebranding. We'll no longer be MHMR. We'll continue that name uh, uh, as our legal name, but uh, we'll come up with something that's a little bit more appropriate and up to date. Um, Peter Colchin will not let me call it Groovy Care. Uh, but uh, we'll, we have gone out to our stakeholders. I believe many of you have gotten uh, a survey. Uh, we've gone to, to the foundations. We've gone to various groups within the community to try and obtain uh, feedback on what that name would, would, would be. Um, we're also working on uh, a strategic plan, which the board just uh, approved my, my five goals for the next year. Uh, and the number one goal that we'll be pursuing is ensuring that we protect or enhance our current services. And the second goal is to ensure that we have uh, clinical appropriate facilities to serve folks that uh, need our help. We're also addressing concerns that have been expressed on our, our lack of diversity. Um, I take that very seriously and I've uh, previously served on the state's diversity committee uh, trauma-informed care, and also benefits and comp. We're looking at how do we start at the bottom of our organization and raise the salaries because we should not be losing people to Bucky's. No offense to Bucky's, but we're not we're not flipping burgers here. We're taking care of people, and so um, we believe we can help save costs by increasing productivity and salaries. Since the ADF legislative session. And even this year, we, we do uh, have some good in indicators of uh, the state will continue to take care of behavioral health needs in Texas. Uh, certainly, we're not the, the best um, funded state. However, uh, since the 80th legislative session, the state <coughs> has added an additional $384 million to crisis services in Texas. And um, they, they continue to provide opportunities for us. Uh, to, to better serve our communities. Um, <clears throat> and currently we're, we're just wrapping up and waiting for some data um, from the state on, on terms of how our budgets will look, but certainly uh, unlike we originally proj uh, projected that we may lose funds, we, we've been pretty well reassured that we will keep the funding we've had uh, in, in terms of state funded sources. Great to be here. Thank you very much. You know, we've, this is a really uh, an interesting topic. Uh, I'd actually hoped to bring my grandson here today. He's eight years old and took him out to the uh, Clifton Honoring yesterday and, and uh, be, be able to see the Chamber of Commerce and the total scope of what happens in, you know, in cities. But uh, I really wanted to give him a civics lesson about, uh, you know, the kinds of things that can happen when people aren't really concerned about uh, who gets credit, but how people can come together in a collaboration and collective approach to try to make positive things happen. Uh, this is, uh, you know, B, B always talked about helping those who can't help themselves, and this is one of those projects where 
<clears throat> we've watched, uh, you know, our state literally kick the can down the road for 40 or 50 years relative to uh, things surrounding this uh, special topic of mental health. And, you know, we have such a huge opportunity to change this. And the Crisis Hub is, I think, that type of solution. Uh, and the good thing about it is that there really is a return on investment for this. Uh, Judge was in a lot of meetings with the BHLT, which I'll talk about in just a second, where when we went around the room, virtually everybody made the statement that, uh, you know, we're kind of all wasting money to some degree, and how do we effectively use our resources? Seven years ago, the Meadows Foundation up in Dallas uh, awarded a $10 million grant to try to deal with mental health in the state of Texas. And uh, they immediately went out and found an individual who matched that 10 million with their 10 million and then continued to raise additional funds and basically put together a corpus of about 27, 28 million dollars to, to be able to deal with the creation of the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute. Very active, uh, who's who around the state of people who are involved in that. Uh, very successful organization and one of their goals was to go around the state and try to create <coughs> behavioral health leadership teams in communities to be able to deal with mental health related issues. And uh, special thanks to, you know, I want to thank a lot of people here so that you all can see the scope of what's, you know, been going on behind the scenes. Uh, Matthew Polk, who initially was with Prosper Waco, was uh, one of the co-chairs along with me for several years, and uh, then, you know, he's a uh, chief operating officer for Waco Family Medicine now. Then Tom Thomas replaced him, and Tom is still the current co-chair for the be behavioral health leadership team, but, you know, those two guys were instrumental in getting a very difficult process started. Uh, and I want to thank also, Daniel had the, the individuals listed up there, and they were probably 23 to 25 of them who have uh, gotten involved from an unwavering commitment perspective to try to provide leadership <coughs> to help us Excuse accomplish me. things that needed to be accomplished. And Daniel mentioned medical clearance, certainly, and the continuity of care program uh, that uh, was funded by the Episcopal Health Foundation to the tune of a little over half a million dollars, you know, was a part of that. And the third basic strategy that we wanted to try to develop tied to the crisis hub and what we needed to do to make that work. Uh, currently, uh, and the, the, those people have quarterly for close to four years, Judge, uh, you know, been involved with, in an unwavering perspective, come to meetings, haven't sent anybody else so we've been dealing with the, the major players in our community to create effective uh, strategies for mental health solutions for our area. And it's been Judge Felton, it's been former Mayor Deaver, it's been now current Mayor Dylan Meek, our hospital executives were all involved, Jackson Griggs at Waco Family Medicine, uh, Ricky Armstrong, former Chief Holt, uh, we've already met with uh, you know, our new chief Victorian, so she's aware and she will be at our you know, next meeting yeah. in the next few weeks. Will's been involved as well. Will's there, judges. We've had judges involved. We've had foundation yeah. executives. We've had MHMR staff. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a, uh, you know, an amazing group of people that have faithfully attended these meetings and tried to come up with solutions. And uh, the, the crisis hub uh, is uh, front and center at this particular point in time. And I think their leadership commitment speaks, uh, you know, a great deal about what we see in this community when we get our backs to the wall and we know there's something that we need to deal with and, and make happen. And uh, the behavioral health leadership team will be a force in this community for years and years to come the way we have, have uh, structured this. Um, much appreciation, you know, in my closing remarks, and I'm sure you all would have questions that we would love to answer, is, 
uh, a lot of appreciation to Peter Colchin. Uh, many of you don't know that Peter's actually been on the board of MHMR for 30 years. And he's been the chairman of that board for 20 years. Glad we hadn't had to pay him. And, <laughs> well, you know, he'd been negotiating with you, you know, Judge, about a raise every year, too. But, yeah. uh, and, you know, that involvement really says something about Peter and his commitment to the, uh, the community. But I think the most important thing that he did was he engineered the hiring of this man right here. Uh, Daniel Thompson knows what he's doing. He's got tons of connections down in Austin. Uh, this is one of the uh, major strategic plans that's ever been created by MHMR. And, uh, you know, Daniel's put us in a position to move a lot of things forward uh, with MHMR. That, again, helps the underserved and those who can't help themselves. And, uh, you know, last, uh, you know, judge to you and all the commissioners, uh, you know, we've spent a little bit of, uh, you know, time together in this process. And uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present what we're trying to do here. Uh, you know, uh, there are uh, solutions that are always available if you end up looking hard enough and you end up being committed to them to the degree that, you know, that you are to make that uh, work. Uh, Daniel mentioned, uh, you know, the money, your money is important, uh, the county money is important, the city money is important. You know, there are a lot of people that are kind of waiting for, you know, for whatever that decision, you know, you know, is or isn't. And, uh, and I don't say that to put any pressure on you because that's not the appropriate thing to do. Uh, what I do want to say is that this uh, project is much needed. Uh, Waco's not getting any smaller, and you know we're all excited about Chip and Joanna and the economic development numbers <coughs> that were just fascinating in the luncheon yesterday. And Waco's going to continue to grow, and these are the kind of situations that we've got an opportunity to fix, do it in a reasonable way, and again in a way that uh, is uh, really co can be cost conscious because of the savings that are that are possible here. But, uh, you know, I personally, and I know Daniel does too, and others admire the leadership that, uh, you know, you all have shown relative to mental health and this topic. And uh, we just look forward to, uh, we're kind of shovel ready. You know, when you got Brian Nicholson and he's ready to roll, and, uh, you know, I think we're in a position where we're, you know, eight and a half million, 8.7 million, uh, you know, something in that, that line. and that you know, includes your money, but there are, you know, other people in places to uh, still search if we, if we have to. But I think, uh, Judge and Commissioners, this is the kind of program where, you know, before December 1st, we could have shovels in the ground and a groundbreaking ceremony so people would actually be able to see the results of all the energy and efforts and the decision making up and down the line. Good. Any, any questions? Have. Current capacity at DePaul is what? We, we currently have the it's twelve beds. Twelve beds. But uh, we're we're not able to be full because of COVID issues. Right. But if you were, it would twelve. Yes. And and the, and it, will DePaul then go away when this new one is built? We, we don't know. Uh, again, there's there's a lot of opportunities for us to if we could keep it. It allows us to, to do overflow. Um, exactly, because yeah. in, in reality, going to a 16 bed and <clears throat> losing a 12 is a net of four. Right. It'd be a lot, it would be great to have a, a 28. <laughs> Absolutely, and at my last center, which was half the size of, of part of Texas, I had 32 beds. There you go. Which also included step down housing. One of the issues sometimes with us trying to get people out of jail or diverted away from an emergency room is having a place for them to go. Right. And so uh, there are additional opportunities, but if we can get get a facility that is fully staffed and, and, and has the size that we need to allow those other community partners to come in, 
provide those services. Hopefully we can avoid jail altogether or, or the emergency rooms. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Certainly. And we plan to, you know, to try to get a better understanding uh, what Ascension or Providence is going to do and uh, other entities as well. Uh, they had taken on this many years ago and uh, although it, it was, they, it's not a profitable business. Uh, no. <laughs> and so that's why you have to have the community step up to do it. But uh, when it was like was told me when they were losing a million to two million dollars a year, they could absorb it when it got up to four and four and a half million dollars. And that's when they were hollering calf rope, they needed some help. And, uh, and that's when, uh, along with all the things that we were doing, started kicking in gear about, you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to pick this up. We can't let it. Well, the thing that's so interesting about this commissioner to your question is that, you know, when you've got regulations that only allow you to build a facility with a roof covering 16 beds, and that's it. You, you, you can't build one right. without giving up, you know, all the resources and the funding. So, and I think one of the great things about Daniel and his background is that he's. I mean, you, you take a look at the people on these committees, and and Major Armstrong now, right. and and you know Chief Holt, and trips to Longview, and trips to Texas Tech, uh, or uh, out to Lubbock to see their like $50 million facility that they've had funded by the state on like three separate occasions over the last 40 years. Uh, you go down to Austin and, and uh, you know, see the center there, uh, you know, which ours will, you know, be basically twice that size. But there are ways to deal with the regulations based on, you know, the knowledge that Daniel has and potential additional funding for yeah. any expansion down the road. And I mean, we just can't be relying on Rusk for, you know, a few beds out there. Yeah, I mean, no. is it, Waco's too important? We sit right in the middle of, of uh, you know, th this state and Central Texas. And it's just, it's a great opportunity to solve this and have a plan in place for the growth for years to come for Waco. Well, we're deeply involved. I think I've counted there's at least six members. Uh, we didn't mention Dustin Chapman a while ago, who actually attended uh, some of those facilities, but uh, that are involved trying to figure out solutions. So you got the judicial side, you've got the incarceration side, you got the prosecution side, you got the business side uh, with Commissioner's Court involvement with uh, Commissioner. Jones and myself, and so you know, we, it's it's uh, we think it's important enough to spend that kind of time. Thank you. It, so. well, it came very apparent to me that this <coughs> is a huge issue for the county when I first came on the court. Yeah. And so, um, when your largest mental institution in the county is the county jail, absolutely, and the largest mental institution in the state <coughs> of Texas is the Harris County Jail. There's, that just doesn't, that just, that's just not right. I mean, it's no. not a, it's not a workable situation. Not fixing anything. It's, it's not fixing anything. And you get to dig in even, you know, you dr start drilling down and you see, I mean, we're 1,300 <clears throat> psychiatrists short in the state of te Texas, trained psychiatrist. It's not easy to become a psychiatrist. I mean, that 1,300? Right. And that's just so but putting somebody in jail because we don't have a psychiatrist for them to see is not a is not is not the is not a workable uh, situation I mean it's just not it's not the correct thing to do it's not sustainable correct so, and, it, and it becomes a huge burden on the taxpayers right most of our psychiatrists right now are contracted and live in other states or other cities. Yeah, right, and doing the... <clears throat> oh, and yeah. they don't have facilities. Uh, yeah. That's right. why they get frustrated and leave. I think that has a big part mm -hmm. of it. Uh, Judge, I do know in, in, you know in talking with Dr. Griggs that you know, we've got that great residency program for physicians out there. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned to Jackson, particularly after we met with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ritz out at 
uh, the VA. Mm -hmm. And she says that, to your point, Commissioner, which is completely accurate, they've got, they've got budgeted money that goes unspent every year because they can't fill those physician, physicians. So I told Jackson, you know, I think Waco Family Medicine needs to look at creating a residency program for psychiatry and also psychology. Mm. And I actually went to Dallas last week to talk to some larger foundations up there about the possibility of if we had programs like that where we were trying to develop in Waco, would you be interested in helping fund those programs to get us started? That's a smart way to approach it because <coughs> we already know that what percentage of the residents out there end up living in? 50% of them become primary care. Yeah, here. Yeah, within within this area, that's yeah. Right. So, yeah. Judge, I, I think it's great. And, and, and to, you know, all you commissioners, we can't. Uh, I mean, I, I talked to the Kellogg Foundation the other day, and they're a six billion dollar foundation. We we don't have the resources to, you know, the local foundations aren't big enough. The you know, just Waco, and this is just the growing town. I mean, we're going to look a whole different. Uh, you know, from a different perspective, 50 years from now, uh, and you know, Judge, you may be the only one still alive. I, I can't I, wait to see. I don't it. think I'm gonna make it. But you know, <coughs> the bottom line is that there oh. are there are there are foundations the out you there me? that I believe that have the resources to help us with the expansion of our services and and to bring other programs like this that will that will help. We we just this is just an expansion of the foundation that we have to let everybody out there, you know, the Meadows Foundation and Gates Foundation and all those others that yeah. we're gonna play and, you know, we're yeah. gonna be serious about what we're doing. And uh, I think that that's, you know, incredibly important. And these are first uh, steps, you know, Will, to your point and others that we, we appreciate your, your time in visiting. Yeah, oh, I know. Daniel, I think it's, uh, it's amazing what you've accomplished since you got here. And um, I, I applaud you for that. I appreciate uh, that. Uh, I hear nothing but good things. Uh, our briefings that we get are you're incredible, and you're you're going to put us in a good spot. Uh, well, there there's there's a lot of uh, I, I've I've got a good team. Um, we're we're going through cultural changes, and we need to. Uh, it, it's not that we're changing because. Uh, the system was broken. The, the The entire system is changing, and we have to be more proactive in our care. Um, we're We're looking at trying to to hire a full time person to to handle all things judicial, uh, all justice involved programs. Um, you know, you mentioned the largest care provider for behavioral health is is the jail. The unfortunate thing is. Quite often, that's the only way somebody is going to get into the state hospital, mm -hmm. and it should not be that way. Uh, Ms. Miller and I have previously spoken about a, a, a case, and because of the relationships I have, once the person uh, had the interaction with law enforcement, we were in, in working with one of the relatives, we were able to kind of grease the skids and get get the placement into the state hospital a lot quicker. But the chances that the, the average inmate or, or the average citizen will ever get into the state hospital is, is very low. And that's unless they go through the judicial system. And then you've got Judge Hodges who may sentence somebody to, to go to the state hospital they're likely to be much better or decompensate one or the other before they ever reach those doors. And so we have to figure out those solutions. And one of the things that I've, I've spoken with several of you about is just justice involved. And, and recently, uh, Judge heard my uh, uh, and Tom's presentation over at HotCog, <clears throat> and we have spoken about getting a, a region-wide um, uh, jail diversion meeting going on and that that is currently being booked uh, but we have what I have suggested is that we take that opportunity to meet with judges and law enforcement to say these are the things we can offer this is our scope of practice now what do we need 
And once we identify those needs, we start working with the, the foundations and the other uh, stakeholders to come up with a strategic plan. Because uh, again, we're not ever going to be able to cover all the needs. And we've got partners like Waco Family Medicine, we've got Prosper Waco that I share a position with. I'm sharing a position with, with Tom's agency. And so those are the types of strategies we can employ, but, uh, and this is a passion, um, we spend a lot of time with, with inmates and we do very little for victims of crime. And, and I think there's a injustice there. And so we, we have to also take on that piece. And currently we're in the process of working with the governor's office to try and get a, a human trafficking grant for children. And so that, that I hope will be the catalyst for us to get this going, but we desperately need a full-time position to take on all things justice involved because currently um, it, it is underserved within my organization. And we need to do a lot more with it. Well, the uh, other piece that I had, and then I'll be quiet, is I want to thank you as well, Tom, because <clears throat> you've kept me in, in through lunches and, and conversations. You've kept us surprised as you've moved along, and our poor foundations played a huge part in this. And so, I'm, absolutely, I'm just tickled we're having this conversation. We're honored to be a part of it, and Mr. Rappaport is watching this meeting today. There you go, <laughs> because we've got uh, you know such huge opportunities to you know help people and. B was all about that, so he'd be very excited about what we're all trying to do. Good, good, good. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> Not directly. Okay. Interjection in relation to this, to me, this speaks to, it, Tom talking about shovel ready in December, speaks to the urgency of getting our heads together with the City of Waco and other law enforcement agencies on a 24-7 MHMR unit to be ready to go when that's ready to go. Yep. And I said this before, this, this to a T is, is ARP yeah. Uh, yeah. eligible. I mean, there's, there doesn't, there's nothing else that, that's, that's more, uh, in my opinion, more eligible than, than this, uh, this project. Yeah. Yeah, this project. You can do it right. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll take everything that you can give us. Okay. <laughs> Only then yeah, we, we absolutely. will we'll, we'll turn another penny back. Looking good. But, but, but looking good. It's about solving the problem. That's right. And the opportunities. So. Well, appreciate so much y'all coming and making the presentation. Thank and you. Thank very you. Much. We appreciate all Be in you. touch. All right, I'm going to take a five minute recess and then we're going to come back and uh, go into executive session briefly. Uh, and uh, when I come back into session, I'll announce the uh, uh, this section that we'll go under executive session in. And judge quickly before yeah. you do that, real quick. Thanks to you and Will too, because I know you guys have yes, been on this thing from the beginning. On this. And thank y'all for representing us and helping this. Major old. Armstrong, too. Mm -hmm. and right. you too, Major. If you're there, <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> Recording stopped. TMP has done a great job uh, with MHMR and the board and uh, all the real estate aspects. That this is how all this started a couple of years ago, trying to figure out you know, where we might do something like this. Don't know. brag on him too much. It's hard. He's hard to live. <laughs> 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 right. we'll we'll keep him in line so we'll go to This is the place to come. <laughs>
fixing to go into uh, executive session uh, under section 551.072 of the Governor Code uh, regarding real property. And uh, I want to, uh, I want to uh, leave in the room uh, or in the, on the call, uh, the space uh, and long range planning group, which is TJ, uh, Zane, uh, Ken Bass, Francis will be in here. If Francis is out there, would you tell her to come in? Yes, I'll get her. Thank you. And Dustin and uh, Mr. Jim Peavy. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Okay, it's 355. Let's call court back in session. All right, Francis. Um, so we have heard from the entities we had scheduled for today. Um, I wanted to just go over a, a few thing, a few things before tomorrow, um, and we can't we can keep going if there's things we want to if we want to start going through those entity requests, and y'all give me some guidance there. Um, if not, we can go through those tomorrow. Um, but there were two entities: the Waco Sports Commission and um, Animal Birth Control. Um, their schedules allowed them to, to be with us tomorrow. So we have one mid morning and one first in the afternoon. So we'll just fit those in. Is through the, the day. animal birth control asking for the same thing they had last year? No, they are asking for an increase. Four. Yes, sir. Is it is it for to underwrite uh, operating or is it a capital bill? Um, it is. She actually just sent it to me just a few minutes ago. Um, so I am. Um, oh, remember. I'm sorry, she said she was going to send it to me soon here, so. Okay, well, I would just fix say if it was what it was last year. No, it was, it was, it was different. How much more, do you know? I'm getting there. What about, that time? What about um, the sports commission, it's the same? Um, I have not received a number from them as of yet. Okay. Uh, do you know, what, are you, who's, who's on the sports commission now? You're on it now. Uh, I don't know it's come up. Well, you know they had lost. Uh, I guess they had lost opportunity because of COVID. You know the, the one event was huge. You got canceled. Uh, I don't know if they're asking for. They, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know if they're asking for an increase. No, I know they've got a huge event coming up. That Iron Man. Two of them back to back. Yeah, so I mean it's a yeah. monster. Yeah, is it going to be lost revenues or is it for? Yeah, yeah, just under operational. Operation. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yes. Yeah. Just we'll find out. Yeah, and there's a there's a couple of uh, requests that definitely would go to the one. You know, one is MHMR's request. Mm -hmm. The other one is uh, family uh, family health. Family health. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah. those capital projects. Yeah. Is. Mm -hmm. I mean, they seem to both qualify under mm -hmm. the yeah. rescue plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know and. I don't know if this is the right time to talk about. It. We were, Dustin and I were chatting earlier um, today, and you know, looking at the nonprofits, I think it's best if you have some consistent way that these nonprofits can apply, and that's where a company like BKD can help put together some portal or some way to to monitor those applications. Because the the guidance it says, you know, you can give to, you can contribute to nonprofits to replace lost revenue, um, mm -hmm. and so you know. There's there's things that may be required of them to, to prove that there was some revenue loss there. So yep. I think just being consistent with the way that's decided upon is probably going to be key. Dustin, us. would that include uh, the crisis center's request or the? I think those are different. different. Those yes. Are yes. Really yes, sir. Different. I think I think the court can view those um, differently mm -hmm. because uh, you know why put them in. For BKD to manage when we already know they'll qualify and we can. But you're going to have to report it is the thing, and yeah. that's what. Um, and there's a there's a report at the end of July coming yes. up. Yes, yes. There's an interim. Uh, yeah. July 31st. So you're going to have to report it. Additional guidance or what is it? Uh, you. It is. Uh, there is. A, there's like additional. So, like, if we had already spent some money, we need to be reported in the end of that July. Even if you haven't spent money, you, okay. have, to, you have to report. And was the way I understood the... Okay. The, if we've got the money, we've so, probably got a report to do. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was August 31st. So, Katie had pulled that August 31st, there's an interim report and then a... Um, I can't read already. A plan performance report. I guess some, you know, just kind of a, a general... I did, but but we had heard also that some of the reports are going to need to include a lot of um, demographic information and other information that we may not have the ability to, to pull or the manpower to pull. So, um, uh, and then October thirty first is our first quarterly project and expenditure report. If okay. there's anything spent, on be, did we get uh, <laughs> did did BKD get back the agreement oh, back yeah. to us? 
They did send a, and it's really, I don't know if you'd call it a proposal or not. I'll forward it to court today. And just what I was thinking when Francis was saying that, you know, we can really tailor, um, we're probably gonna need to have some in-depth conversations with VKD because we could probably have it where they were set up to handle all of our reporting for every dollar spent, but still not where they're not at actually administering like the funds to MHMR and some of those others to where we can, if the court approves those projects, they can move forward, but let BKD still do the reporting on them. Mm -hmm. but, but there has to be some co sort of cooperative effort between them and if we go with LAN for infrastructure that, that they know what, that the left hand knows what the right hand's doing so they can fully report that action also. Yes, sir. And, you know, we usually, you know, when we've worked before with the CARES Act, you know, all of those costs are running through our office and we're accounting for them in the grant funds. And then we would we would be pushing that information to BKD and working closely with them to make sure that um, what they were putting together was we were comfortable with. But I'd love to say that we could do all the reports ourselves, but it's just um, no. just just don't have the, the no, manpower in our office to do so. It would seem that we need to we need to uh, expediently, so Tom was telling uh, me that expeditiously, ever how you want to put it, fast, mm -hmm. get with be ever who we're going to use mm -hmm. as a third party mm -hmm. and get 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 the ball rolling there. Right. Okay. Okay, um, going back to the question on ABC, on animal birth control, yeah. um, and the request is, um, and of course, Kerry will be here tomorrow, but the request was 125,000. Um, ABC is ready to promote free spay, neuter, microchip services, provide outreach and transportation throughout the county to properly reach areas in need. And so she has some other explanation, but I think it's, you know, just further outreach into those. 125,000? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. From 19? What was it last year? 19. 19,000. Is that to build a building or build? It's just, she says that that would, that would cover over 1,500 animals um, for spay, neuter, microchip. Mm -hmm. She says the past funding level prevents services from being promoted um, that would be exhausted within three months. So I guess that 19,000 just, is it more of it? I mean, it just, I guess, just, just further outreach um, for their services. That's what, that, I'm just reading off of here. That might, that might end up having cats and dogs on the, uh, on the uh, endangered species list. No <laughs> animals left. That's the goal. <laughs> okay. Mm. So, like I said, she, that just kind of that late breaking information, but she can explain that request tomorrow as well. I dies, I'm going to have a taxidermy. <laughs> okay. Uh, we okay. might have met too long. I don't know. Um, Mr. Miller, you need to straighten us out. And watch <laughs> over us. We need somebody to call our ear. Well, All so right. I just I just wanted to just kind of just kind of come back and gather our thoughts. So of course, um, our goal has and is Tuesday to file the proposed budget and for you all to vote on the proposed tax rate. Um, so, you know, the proposed budget, again, it is the proposed budget. So it's that milestone that allows the public to see what you plan on um, for the next year and allows them the opportunity to speak on that in a public hearing. So we can make changes throughout that, that next month that passes, um, you know, whatever you wish to add or, or, or take out. Um, so to get to that point where we want to be on Tuesday, we still need to cover some personnel issues tomorrow and right. um, that we tabled last week. Um, go through this list of contracted programs and economic development requests and see what you fill on those. Um, and then, like I said, there's a handful of things that we just need to, to go back and um, clean up. Um, I got two questions. On, oh, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> about Tuesday. Historically, traditionally, that preliminary budget is pretty much the budget. We pretty much... Historically, yes, we've tried to tried to to put in the proposed what you what you what you want to propose. With that. But but definitely we can you know we can, we usually make some small adjustments here and there. Um, but any any change can be tax rate we can go down, but not up. But not up from the proposed. So um, the certified appraised values will be ready on the twenty fifth, which okay. is on Sunday. So Monday we should have those. The tax office will help us work quickly to recalculate the rates. 
So then, you know, those rates that we've been looking at, those are just based on that preliminary appraised mm -hmm. values number. Um, so we will have that on Monday. Um, and then Tuesday when we come in here, we'll have that those numbers refreshed and we can look at those. And then, you know, based on, on what that's changed, you can determine what rate you want to propose then. But again, like you said, you yeah. can't you can't go up. So um, from it, but you work. can decrease. We need to do our work between today and Monday, though. We're just going to have to so do we need to work. work. And, <laughs> and on Monday, as, so and Monday, as soon as I have those figures, I will shoot them out to you all so that you can okay. see. After tomorrow, you know, we'll have our kind of big picture. Here's what our ending fund yeah. balance is going to look like. I'll update that, those on. We will update those on Monday. And then um, I'll give those to you. So Tuesday, you know, we can we can talk through that. Um, and, so that's we're the still, plan. and we're still shooting for a no new revenue rate. Right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that correct? I mean, that's our intent. That's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. And, well, and, and no new revenue rate. <laughs> let me get this straight. Or, or please ask the question. If And I'm using this hypothetically. Uh -huh. No new revenue rate does not include new properties that have come on. Correct. But for someone who was already on the tax roll mm -hmm. last year, a uh, uh, homeowner, that means their county taxes would not have gone up from last year to this year. Correct. That's, that's what we're looking at. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. And okay. can't we just, if we're still in a in a flux of where we need to be, mm -hmm. it's like you said before, we can always pass the no new okay. revenue rate and we still have all that time to decide, can we go below it or not? Yes. Right. 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 So. Definitely. Yeah. It, Help me again, no new revenue rate. Okay, that means we're not gonna bring in any more money than what we brought in this year so no. dollars no okay. um but if you looked at the same properties that were on the same or were on the roll last year mm -hmm. um the appraised as a whole those those values went up so the rate that would generate the tax rate that would generate the same amount of dollar revenue for those pre-existing properties less exemptions yes and so lots of little little intricacies Expenses there on that yes that we can um, we lower we continue to lower the tax rate until we meet that that amount from the prior year with the exception of new, property. new properties that came up that so came then up. that those okay. new properties get added that's on. where we take on there's also the expenses budget. that get to yes. be uh, excluded from that calculation correct our indigent health our indigent defense right and our, our cost okay. of our state ready prisoners okay. So we calculate those, and then those things have, are those are already calculated. They're calculated for a year ending June thirtieth, not our fiscal year, but June. The 30th. no new revenue rate decreases our tax rate about four and a half percent, or something. I just yeah. the revenue. You mean so just to boil it down, no, just the tax numbers, rate. A person who paid a thousand dollars in county taxes last year under no new revenue uh -huh. would pay a thousand dollars this this year. Not necessarily. Okay, yes and if no. They had so how, yes, yes. how is it no? Because wow. that's what I thought. If because, of the, because of the calculation. I mean, I, the way I like to look at it is uh, okay. the, um, the no new revenue rate um, is a, a decrease of, say, 4%. Our, On the right. Uh huh. Our valuations, our total valuation is up 8%. So that's a net of, so you're, you're we're, we're bringing in 4% more. On that house last from last year? Well, that includes new. The new. new, that, new that, not so it necessarily. Looks as a whole. But let's say that you're, right. so, and I gave this example uh, at the beginning of, if, if you have, if your if your valuation went up ten percent by by law, which is the most it can go up unless you are not homesteaded, you, let's say your home went up ten percent, which I'm sure a lot of a lot of homes went up ten percent. They did certain areas. They did on me. They do on me every year. You went for me to, you because went, I you know because one year I contested it and it got uh, and they go up more than ten percent. But uh, but if it went up ten percent, uh huh, and we cut it, 
we cut the rate four percent, and that's a net ten per six percent that the more that the, the taxpayer has to pay. So okay, here's here's the calculation. Uh, if we do the no new revenue rate of um, Four four six nine two nine. That's the current tax rate. No, that is the no new revenue. That's the that's the, okay, that's the, that's no, the no new, new rate. Okay. Four four six nine two nine. Yeah. That is a four point six five percent decrease in the current from the current rate. Okay. Our so our <coughs> our certified values are up eight percent. So if you're, um, if you're, so then your average, your average tax bill is going to go up 3.35%. Okay. Well, depending on how much of that 8% was new properties that are coming on. Well, we never get that information. It's so it's so dug deep and it's all embedded. So it's still it's even so at that. It's not so really hard to, to, to pin it down to the penny. Okay. Is right. You but, can't, but the not idea, the idea of the no new revenue rate is what? Like, I know the current rate means I'm just going to adopt the same rate I have this year. Uh huh. And then I, I bring in additional Listen, money because of the new, new properties or increase in appraisal values. Now, if I want a no new revenue rate, even though I'm taking in account new properties and changes in appraisal value, but do those taxes drop on those individuals? Because I'm saying I'm only going to bring in the same amount of money that I brought in this year. And it just depends on the it just depends on the appraised value of their house is all it's okay. what it comes down to. Well, um, but but what I'm interested in is the taxpayer not paying any more money this year than last year. Whatever you want to call it, uh -huh. and, and that's where whatever you want to call it, an individual taxpayer, an individual taxpayer. You're not going to be able. To, it would be impossible. You're not going to be able to figure that out. You could take the average taxpayer. You know, best thing you could probably do is figure up based off a hundred thousand dollar home, which is how it's assessed, and then work uh -huh. from there. So what's so the benefit of the no new revenue rate? Here's a little blurb, it's and it's the kind legislature's of way of. Commissioner uh, Miller. disguising it's their really, inability it's really to, for us. to come up with a, with a fair system. Okay. We're understanding we're not going to bring in more revenue than we did. So that's really more. Okay, okay. You know what I'm saying? For yeah. homeowners, it depends on where you're at. It's for okay. us. Where your house is at. This, this, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. We're bringing in the same amount of money we brought in. On, on, on the properties that were here last year, the prior or the existing. If there was only one property in the county and. Less that. a lot of exemptions. So. Yeah. Okay, I got it. And it, and it, like the state comptroller says, it enables the public to evaluate the relationship between taxes for the prior year and the current year. So it's more of a kind of a, okay, you know. Francis will give me one on one. I'm not very good. <laughs> She's good one on one. Good. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's where we're at. And so tomorrow, <laughs> I'm not trying to not trying yeah. to change the subject if y'all want to keep going. Um, but tomorrow we just really want to, you know get through those work. things that we still need to and, and get some of course if you're not ready tomorrow then of course we just you know we can continue discussions after the proposed is filed but we do have to file the proposed um next to stay on our on our on our, on our yeah. we, we get it done. i do i do want to make one other comment before we move on um there is a revised schedule on the workshop drive um but there has been one change um so there was a it was house bill 1357 um, it had made some changes to our budget um, hearing timeline and when you when you adopt relative to the hearing and different things like that those pieces that would have applied to a county our size our size dropped off of that bill so I originally when I did the calendar I did it anticipating that they would have stuck but they did not so I have revised the calendar back to the way it used to be to where we have the budget hearing on the day that we adopt the budget um, so originally we had the budget hearing on August 3rd. It moves it to August 24th. And the way the law reads, it says, at the conclusion of the public hearing on the budget, you will vote on the budget. So they were trying to get that changed and, and it did not It did not fly. So um, that's one change there. Um, again, that's, that's 
we were already going to be meeting that day anyway, so mm -hmm. um, no additional meetings needed. But just wanted to point that out. And no hearings. Nope. No hearings. Right, so we don't have to have the evening hearing and all that. So you only have to have one now. Mm -hmm. um, so we will have one public hearing on the tax rate on August 17th. Mm -hmm. And that kind of depends on what rate you end up going with too. There's some different things there, but that's, mm -hmm. that's when we have that scheduled. Tuesday, August 17th, and then Tuesday, August 24th mm -hmm. is when we'll have the public hearing on the budget. And, and then immediately after we vote on the budget and the tax rate in those, that order. On here, too, you have on next Tuesday, I guess we approved to send out the written salary notices to the elected officials. Yes. So we got to so, know what the COLA is by Tuesday. Yes. And so elected officials are on a completely different timeline, but we try to incorporate it into the, the budget tax rate timeline so that the judge's office knows what amounts to put in there. Are we going to work but, through the COLA tomorrow? Yes, um, Anna is going to be speaking on that, and you can make okay. it, make, you know, some, and the thing is with elected officials, if you said, here's X amount of COLA, those letters are going to go out to elected officials. If you changed your mind on the COLA for some reason, by the time we adopt, we, we can't change that elected yes. official amount. Well, we could, it would start the timeline over again with the grievance, um, wow. salary hearing, it then increases have to be published in the paper. Um, so there is a lot of steps there for elected official salaries. So um, kind of make, so make all that got, work together. We got a half a day tomorrow. We got a whole day Thursday. Uh, oh. And then we, we may not want to be here Friday. And we Sorry. normally don't do Monday, but we got to be ready to file the preliminary budget on Tuesday. We might I mean, be, I think we, we could we work through just about anything by on Tuesday that we hadn't definitely cleaned up. I think we got this. So tomorrow, I think we can get through a lot, um, and then well, we're all day, tomorrow, all day, aren't we? all day tomorrow. Um, well, we can do all day. Pardon me. I think you're busy in the morning. No, that's today's, today's morning. Wednesday. That, uh, oh, day Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you. know what day it is, but we're going to have me on that, that no new revenue rate. But I was going with you. I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, okay. But we could, okay. yeah, but we, yes, okay. we can work through anything Tuesday too. I mean, whatever, you know, before we, before yeah. you all are ready to, to file that. So. Now, yeah, like, are we posted for uh, Friday in case? Yes. yes. This Friday. It may be that we have a, we need to meet some Friday too. Mm -hmm. You're trying to do everything on Tuesday. Mama said, "Don't put off till tomorrow." No, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm here. I'll work whenever. I just can't work. Uh, I'm, I'll work through it whenever. I'm, I mean, I can either, you know, there's always we have this Zoom option now, so it makes it very okay. flexible. In the morning, I'll have an outline. It'll I'll list kind of exactly what we are needing to come back to and, and okay. finish up as as far as what we're what we're needing so some direction from y'all and we can tomorrow just, morning we've got ABC and Sports Commission com, coming in the morning first thing. Oh, so uh, I I got a, huh? Commissioner Perry reminded me of something. We do have at some point need to get a um, uh, a presentation from Randy McGraw about the health plan. So I believe he is. We're trying to get him for tomorrow. Okay, so I don't know when, but we'll just Help plan. merge him in. <laughs> and Commissioner Smith was asking. If I can interrupt, uh, um, Randy McGraw, he is confirmed for tomorrow between 10.30 and 11.30. He has availability, Francis. You still she working? <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow. 10, 10, 30, 11. Okay. <laughs> so tomorrow then we had um, the Waco Sports Commission was going to come at 10. I lost my. ABC. But the, I will just and say then that the. ABC at 1.30, so. Oh, I will just say that the numbers on the health plan are tending, are still trending well. I'd agree. It is healthy and, uh, you know. ABC is what time? It's, it's 1.30. Good. Good. But well, we're going to meet at 9 so we can. Yes, nine o'clock. Okay. I think we get our mind set. We can get a lot done tomorrow. And if we need to do it a little Friday morning, we can, but uh, we have to take care of other business too. So that's true. We and we should get some answers back from Elizabeth, maybe tomorrow on the fire. Yes, on, on the what fire. what exactly those yeah, are. Well, not really, I mean, it's just kind of like two questions. We're at their two we're at their mercy. We're not but I don't know. I know Judge Felton sees the quarterly reports because he and I both sign off on them. But 
um, we when they, when they send us the reimbursement quarterly, it's like a stack, and someone in our office goes through every single invoice and audits and makes sure that it's in line with their budget and that we agree with those charges. Um, From emergency so, management. Maybe? Yes. Okay. So those things, you know, when they have things like that in the budget, um, we still get all the detail. Um, Is that there. in the check run? Yes. Yes. Got <laughs> yeah, they bill us four times a year for a quarter of the budget of their expenditures. And then at the end of the year, the state comes back and they reimburse some. And whatever the remaining amount is, they, re they bill us for a fifth time to, to recoup the remaining. So. Judge Elizabeth's already visited with Chief Summers and I have their response. I can read. He's happy to meet with court, but I can read this response in case it's exactly. need. Go ahead. Response from whom? It, this is from Chief Summers on the question on the Bagby Avenue. Okay. So he said, to summarize, Waco Fire provides basic life support as the first responder agency. Fire departments are obligated to respond to medical calls and are often the first to respond to medical emergencies until an ambulance can come over. Although medical facilities have medical staff, they may not be properly staffed to handle emergency situation. In those instances, Waco Fire arrives and performs basic life support medical intervention, um, CPR, etc. It is part of Waco Fire's protocol to respond to all types of medical emergencies in their area. So I don't know if that if still need to um, have him visit with court or if that's no, a, uh, no, it's not gonna just a big price to pay. Or <laughs> they may go over would there and do absolutely make nothing. Sure, would you Sometimes make sure you tell my wife really when she puts me in a living a center <laughs> somewhere that has basic <laughs> life saving skills <laughs> yeah. at, at least? Yeah. <laughs> Some of that's contract personnel. <laughs> what do you want me to tell? Don't put you there. Would you let her know that? Yes, mom, base. I got you covered on that. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Oh, for crying out loud! I gotta go. Okay, uh, on the uh, there was uh, some things that MHMR didn't bring up that we're going to try to get nailed down. That uh, on these different programs and the numbers that are in there, what we had previously, but Dustin, unless you have anything different, we're going to have to get what those contract amounts are. Okay. Our pretrial diversion, uh, medical clearance, which hadn't changed, I don't think, crisis intervention, uh, jail medical contact uh, contract personnel, and Jack Hart Attention Center medical uh, contract personnel. We need, if we can get those contracts by tomorrow so we can get all that improved, approved by court. Okay, anything anything else, Francis? No, sir. Commissioners, anything else? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, so we're posted tomorrow. It'll be a new day, first day of our new posting. So we will adjourn. So Thank you. <laughs> Recording stopped. <laughs>